So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible, you can slip up your hand and we'll put a Bible in your hand. Also, if you need a sheet for notes, you didn't get one of those on the way in, you can get one of those. Key announcements on there and always at the bottom, the connection card, prayer requests, fill it out, drop it in the offering plate as it goes by after the sermon. We would be honored to pray with you for your needs, to praise God with you in the places where he's met your needs. Also, uh, if you want to communicate with us, for example, May 8th coming up, we're going to do a baby dedication. And uh, if you want to let us know, hey, we've got a new child in our lives that we'd like to dedicate to the Lord on Mother's Day, you can jot that down right here. We'll get that message, actually. That's a particularly poignant announcement for me this year. Maybe I should fill that out, drop it in there. First Mother's Day with a real live baby of our own. It's fantastic. All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 5, and and Deuteronomy is actually not the Hebrew name of this book of the Bible, but it is what we've called it for a long time in the church, like a couple thousand years, a little bit more than that, and it literally means second law, deuteronomy, nomos, second law, and when you really get into the book of Deuteronomy, into the meat of it, you come across a lot of laws. In fact, if you need a little map for the book of Deuteronomy, I want to show this slide to you. The first four chapters that we've spent the last two weeks reading are Moses giving a sermon to the people on the brink of entering into the promised land. And these, this first sermon is really the stories of the past. Before he tells them anything of the law, He tells them the story of what God has done in their lives. Because without the story, there's no understanding of the law. But then we get to chapters 5 through 28, the bulk of the book. And this is Moses' sermon of commands for the present. How this people needs to live now as they journey into and conquer and settle in this promised land. Then in chapters 29 to 32, there's a look forward as they are called to make a new covenant with God. And then the very end, the last two chapters are all about Moses' final blessing and and departure, his death. But that chunk in the middle, 5 through 28, if you spent much time reading that chunk of Deuteronomy, you might have come out a little bit confused. I mean, it just seems like a list of randomly assorted commands. Altogether, the rabbis say that in the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, there are 613 commands that must be kept, including ones like this in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 15. You may slaughter and eat meat within any of your towns as much as you desire. It's like a Brazilian steakhouse. (laughs) According to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you, the unclean and the clean may eat of it as of the gazelle and as of the deer. If you're reading that, you might come away kind of wondering, why would God care where I eat my gazelle steaks? And you might also be wondering what eating gazelle steaks has to do with our lives, because not many of us see gazelle steaks in the Kroger meat section. Or maybe you're reading a little bit farther in Deuteronomy, you come across chapter 15, verse 6, talking about taking a year off, the Sabbath year, releasing people from slavery and debt. And then it says in verse 6, the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. And you come away from that command wondering, if I have a car payment or a mortgage note, am I living in deep sin? It says I shall not borrow, but I have borrowed. How do I interpret this? How does this make sense for my life now? Or maybe you're getting a little bit farther on, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, it talks about the king, and it says the king must not acquire many horses for himself, or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And you read that and you think, well, I'm, I'm okay on that. I don't have many horses. 
That's how I feel about it. Maybe some of you do have many horses. It's more of an issue for you. But maybe you're not kings. Even if you have many horses, if you're not a king, I don't know. And if you didn't buy them in Egypt, is it okay? I don't know. And so you get into Deuteronomy and you can start making your way through and it gets difficult to interpret and understand. And, you know, one of the things people like to do at the beginning of the year, New Year's, is commit to reading the Bible in a year. And so you start off in January in Genesis. There's some familiar stories and you know them. You recognize some of the names. You're thinking, all right, this is pretty exciting. You get to Exodus and the first 19 chapters are thrilling. The 10 plagues, let my people go, crossing the Red Sea. Then you hit Mount Sinai in chapter 20 and it kind of sends you on a journey into some laws, but it's only like 18 or 20 chapters there. So you kind of, you make it through those laws. You get a little bit about the golden calf, got some narrative. Okay, I'm tracking with the story. Then Leviticus. It's like the daily diary of a local butcher. You got peace offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings and whole offerings and thank offerings and grain offerings and chopping up stuff, burning stuff, organs being washed in the laver. What is a laver after all? If you have the willpower in that kind of mid-February to make it through Leviticus, stay true to your commitment to read the Bible in a year, you get to Numbers, and whew, there's a few more stories. This is kind of interesting. Also a lot of genealogies, but that kind of goes pretty quick if you skim it. <laughs> yeah, 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 son of, son of, son of, got it, got it, got it. Oh, there's a story. Great, let's read that. <laughs> and then just about this time of year, you turn the page and you get to Deuteronomy. And God telling you where you can and cannot eat your gazelle steaks. And this is the point of the Bible where a lot of people, their plan to read the Bible in a year derails. Just can't keep slugging through this. Because the question keeps coming up. What in the world do these laws have to do with me? And maybe behind that question is a deeper question that we're trying to work out. What really does God want from me? What really does God want for me? This is an important question. Deuteronomy 5, verse 1. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. And Horeb is the way Deuteronomy refers to Mount Sinai. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire. We looked at that phrase last week. While I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up into the mountain. So here Moses is introducing what will be a lengthy discussion of the law. And once again, he's telling the story and he's reminding the people that this is all about the covenant that God has made with them. There are many ways to define covenant Maybe a helpful way as we read Deuteronomy is to define it as a committed, life-giving connection. God wants to be in the life-giving connection with his people. And Moses is speaking to the next generation. These are not the people who left Egypt. That generation has died off because of their unbelief and their unwillingness to move forward with God. And yet... Moses tells this new generation who may not even have been born at the time that God revealed himself at Sinai or if they were alive, they were too young to remember. Moses reminds them that the covenant that God desires was not just a covenant with their fathers, the generation that came before, but a covenant with them. He's bringing what God did and said in the past right into the present into our midst. This is a living covenant with a living God. 
And this living God wants that life-giving connection with you right here. This is part of reading the scripture from that time till now. We're constantly listening to the words that God spoke in the past and the things that God did in the past and hearing them presently now. Not just back then, but what's he doing now? And Moses reminds them that God spoke to the people face to face. This is personal. God desires a personal connection. And yet, though he speaks face to face, he has no form. He speaks out of the midst of the fire. He spoke but was not seen. There were words but no image. And this idea of speaking out of the fire reminds us of the mystery of God. That there's revelation, just like in a flame it gives light, but there's also a mystery to a flame. And, and just like a flame draws us in and warms us, but is at the same time dangerous. That we come close, but if we come too close, we are consumed. It's a reminder here that this personal God who desires a life-giving connection with his people is at the same time transcendent and wholly other and in some ways beyond our comprehension and fully free and absolutely enormous. This is how Moses introduces this section of law. And then he reminds them what God said from the mountain. And he reminds them these words that are of crucial and central importance to the entire Bible. He reminds them of the Ten Commandments. So verse 6, they begin this way. God speaking from the mountain, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth command, observe the Sabbath day, to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner, the foreigner who is within your gates, that your male servant, your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Fifth command, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery and you shall not steal and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. I don't know what comes to mind for you when you hear the Ten Commandments. Maybe Charlton Heston. Maybe some political issue, maybe, maybe stone tablets pops into your mind. But for me, when I was a little guy growing up, my parents, godly people that they are, challenged me to memorize the Ten Commandments. And as a reward, I would get a purple skateboard scooter. And so even to this day, the first thing that comes to mind, what do the Ten Commandments mean? I think, purple skateboard scooter. <laughs> it's one of my earliest memories, actually. That scooter, loved that thing. 
sometimes the Ten Commandments is more of a concept than actually something that we think about living. In fact, there's a very funny interview, and in some ways tragic, from several years ago. Stephen Colbert, in the Colbert Report, kind of a political satire TV show, was interviewing a congressman from a state that shall remain unnamed for his dignity. And this congressman had co-sponsored a bill that the Ten Commandments should be publicly displayed in the House and in the Senate building. And so it was pretty passionate about this issue. And so the interviewer, Colbert, said, wow, you really, you really care about this. I mean, why is it so important? And the guy says, well, can you think of any place better to hang them? Colbert says, well, I don't know. Can you think of any place better? He goes, no, I can't. He said, okay, well, tell me, what are the Ten Commandments? The congressman got three and then said, I don't know the rest. They existed in his mind just as some sort of political football, not as something to really be lived. What do you think of when you think of the Ten Commandments? Maybe you think of very staunch legalism, setting up rigid ruts in which you must live and shall not depart from. In fact, this is a common misconception about the Old Testament. In a lot of lives of Christians growing up, we've heard that the Old Testament is primarily about works. And if we just do the right works, if we do the right things, if we keep the law, in the Old Testament, the story is, if you just work hard enough, then God will give you salvation. And then we hear on the flip side that in the New Testament, because of Jesus, God gives us salvation. And then we obey God out of obedience. And so it's kind of like the Old Testament is all about works and the New Testament is all about grace. But if that is our perception of the Old Testament, that it is a graceless book of rules where God sets up an impossible standard, then we have sorely misread the text. Did you notice the first word of the Ten Commandments? Do you remember the first thing that God says to his people? I am the Lord your God, verse 6 who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The first word of the Ten Commandments is God's reminder of his grace, that he delivered them and set them free first before he asked anything of them. The book of Exodus is 19 chapters of things God has done for Israel before he gives them a law in chapter 20. We just read in Deuteronomy, the first four chapters, reminding them of what God has done for them, the grace he's shown them, not because they earned it. In fact, in spite of their stubbornness, God lavishes his grace upon them, desires the life-giving connection with them. And then he says, out of response to what I have done, keep these laws, keep these rules. And even the rules that he gives, these commands that he gives to the people, are primarily focused on helping them shape their lives in freedom. They were slaves before. Now God teaches them how to be truly human and truly free in life-giving connection with him and with one another. See, if we miss the grace here that God delivers them first and then invites them into freedom by following these commands, if we miss that, then we run the risk of seeing God as a slave master, a taskmaster who simply sits in heaven and sends out all these dictates that we must follow. And if we see God as a taskmaster or a slave master, we are absolutely missing the point. Because the first word of the Ten Commandments is, I delivered you from Pharaoh, the slave master, to bring you into freedom. And so each of these commands is focused on helping the people understand and live in this freedom. So think about the Sabbath command. One day out of seven, do no work. 
In Egypt, Pharaoh gave them no rest. Their lives were working until you die. God says in freedom, I command you to rest because you're more than just what you produce. You're more than just your work. In fact, when you are resting, perhaps you are more of a human being than even when you're driven to turn out income or product. The command to honor your father and your mother. In Egypt, Pharaoh ripped families apart by commanding that children be slaughtered. God says in freedom, I command you to honor your extended families because a healthy family is the core of this new free society. Or you think about the command, no killing. In Egypt, life was cheap. Pharaoh could kill any Jew at any time. God says in freedom, we will preserve life. We will not kill. In Egypt, Pharaoh economically exploited the effort of the people. He stole from their labor. God says, in freedom, there will be no more stealing, no theft, no coveting. We will respect one another and we will respect one another's possessions. In Egypt, the people had no justice. They had no judge. They had nowhere to go if they had been wronged. God says, in freedom, One of the foundational parts of society will be a trustworthy legal system in which there is no false witness. You see how God's shaping these words and these commands to teach the people to live in freedom? These are the words that form the foundation of a free people living in life-giving connection with one another and with God. And these words are actually so important that these 10 give shape to that big chunk of law in chapters five through 26. In fact, people wiser and more expert in Hebrew and who have spent much more time studying the book of Deuteronomy have discerned that that big chunk of statutes and laws in the middle of Deuteronomy actually is shaped and lines up with each of the commands. It's almost like the Ten Commandments are a table of contents. And then we read, for example, chapters 6 through 11 as commentary on the first command. Or chapters 12 and 13 as commentary and explanation of the second command. Chapter 14 is explanation of the third command. There's a table on your notes sheet that shows each of these sections and how they line up with and are shaped by these ten opening commands. In the coming weeks, we'll unpack them in more depth and detail. But for now, we read a few of those obscure passages at the beginning of the sermon. Why would God care where I eat my gazelle meat? Why would he give me all these laws about where I can sacrifice for worship and where I can just eat my meat at home and everything else? Well, those appear in Deuteronomy 12, which is a commentary or explanation and expounding of the second command how we are not to make any images, no carved idols. And the big point in that whole section is that God is totally holy, he's totally unique, and so wherever he says we are to worship him, we're to obey him. We're not just supposed to mix him in with all these other things. That's why it matters where you eat your gazelle steaks and where you make your sacrifices, namely at the place where God chooses his name to dwell. Or... What about this example of debt and lending and not being in debt and taking a year off and the Sabbath and all the rest? This section, chapters 14 through 16, where we find that law is actually explanation of the Sabbath command. And so the Sabbath command says rest one day out of seven. But then in chapters 14 through 16, it expounds and explains how the Sabbath is not just a single day in the week, but it is a deep truth that touches our labor week to week, our work and rest year to year in the festivals, even our finances and our tithes, our material possessions are connected to this concept of Sabbath. Because if we don't trust God enough to rest one day out of seven, 
it means there's no way. We're trusting him to provide. If we're not trusting him to provide, we'll never be free to tithe. See, these are all connected here through the book of Deuteronomy. And what once appeared to be a rather random assortment of laws is in fact a closely interwoven conversation between the Ten Commands and all of these specific laws about the specific time and place. It's gonna be wonderful to read them together. But out of all of these, one is more important, more central than all the others. This first command I mentioned, no other gods before me, it shapes the next six chapters of Deuteronomy. And Moses picks up the story and highlights the significance of this command in Deuteronomy 5, verse 28. He's still retelling of God meeting them at the mountain. He says, the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. And the people, they are trembling before God's revelation. So in verse 29, God says, Oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, Return to your tents. But you, Moses, stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them that they may do them in the land that I'm giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. See, this is the gracious God who's brought them into freedom, is giving them these statutes and these commandments so that they would flourish and prosper. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the commandment, Moses says, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, if you notice in that big chunk of scripture I just read, one word appears twice and it's in the singular form. Five, verse 31, God says, I will tell you the whole commandment. And then verse one of chapter six, this is the commandment, not commandments. A commandment, singular. It's like Moses has shared with them these 10, but then these 10 are really summed up in one commandment, singular. And this one commandment was so important in the eyes of the history of Israel that they recited it, every person, every morning and every evening. And here it is, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes like bangs on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here now Moses takes the 10 words, the 10 commands, and boils them down to one word, one command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. In the Jewish community, this is known as the Shema, which is the Hebrew word. Listen, hear the first word of this command, Shema Israel, 
Listen, Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. As I mentioned, this opens up a section of commentary on the first commandment back in chapter five. You shall have no other gods before me. What the first commandment says in negative terms, no other gods, here the Shema says in quite positive terms, you shall love the Lord your God. He is one. Now there's something interesting in this passage. Actually, there's a number of interesting things here. But one of them is that in the first phrase, there is an open possibility in the way we translate. It could be that it says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or it could be that the translation is that the Lord our God, the Lord alone. There's even a footnote in my Bible, it's helpful, pointing out that in the original language, it could go either way. And I think in the original language, the intent is actually to be a little bit open because each translation leads us into powerful and deep truth. The first translation, emphasizing the Lord your God, the Lord is one, tells us something crucial about who God is. He is one. He is undivided. He is unchanging. He is not fickle. This confession that the Lord is one is a reminder that our experience of and knowledge of God in one time and one place by very definition must be consistent with our experience of and our knowledge of God in another time and place. He's faithful and unchanging. And frankly, sometimes it's hard to believe that. I'll give you an example. This last weekend, we had Jesus and the Quran up at Grace New Hope. Had a wonderful time training a group of folks about sharing their faith in Jesus with their Muslim friends. And through the whole course of the day, we told lots of stories of how God has shown up and worked miracles, worked wonders in the lives of our Muslim friends. Supernatural healing, dreams and visions, amazing stuff. So the whole weekend is full of testimonies of powerful work of God. But about 11, 11.30 on Saturday morning, I got a call from one of the dear women here at Grace, whose son has been fighting cancer for some time. And I knew that her son, we'd been talking, he, he'd been having a hard week, and she called just in tears, saying, he's really not doing well. And the doctors don't know exactly what's causing everything. This round of treatment has pushed him beyond coherence. And he's just in a lot of pain. He's really suffering. And I don't know what to do. And I said, I understand. And we're praying with you. Our team is praying with you guys. Do the simple stuff you see to see. Keep walking with God. And as soon as we're done with the JAQ today, you know, this evening, I'll drive over to the hospital. And so finished up JAQ and last night Amy had to go home and help out with Bethany and then DJ one of the guys on our student team and I drove down to the hospital and we walked into the room and there's our friend and cancer is cruel to the physical appearance it can seem to sap the life out of someone we walked into that room and you know what it's like. If you've ever been in a hospital room, especially of a cancer patient who's really fighting hard, it can be overwhelming. It can be, it can be sometimes even feeling hopeless. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, God, we just spent all day telling stories about how you show up, how you intervene, how you bring hope into hopeless situations, and now I'm here in this hospital room. Are you still the same God here? Because it doesn't feel like it. Have you ever had that? God, I've seen you work in the past, or I saw you work over there. What's going on right here? Because it feels pretty hopeless here. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
He is consistent, the same powerful, mighty, healing God in the Muslim world, in our lives, in the hospital room, even when the circumstances don't look like it. He is one, undivided, not fickle, still the great and mighty, powerful God over all. And so we prayed with this young guy. God actually showed up in some really powerful and miraculous ways. But for me personally, this reminder of the Shema is so poignant coming from a place of so many testimonies and then walking into a situation that in many ways can be overwhelmingly hopeless. The Lord is one. He's undivided. But then the other way that we can translate this passage, the Lord alone it doesn't so much speak to the oneness of God, but the oneness of our own affection. And it's a reminder to us that we are, from our point of view, so often pulled in a hundred directions. And as Dave was talking about earlier in the gathering, our affections can be drawn to and fro. In fact, our entire culture is oriented to draw our affections in a thousand directions. How many times do you look at your calendar and find yourself thinking or even saying, gosh, I'm torn. And we could do this or we could do that or this or that or that or that. It's all on Friday in May. <laughs> or we could buy this or we could buy that. We could buy that and that and that. I mean, you're actually, your life is fine, but you're just torn in a thousand directions about some other thing you might buy and add to your possessions. Our culture constantly draws our hearts this way and that. In fact, Calvin, one of the great reformer, said so many amazing things about what it means to follow Jesus and be a part of God's people, talks about life. Human life is actually impossible without faith. We as human beings always are trusting something. And whether that's someone else or some government or some structure, some institution, or maybe it's trusting ourselves or it's trusting God, we are always living with faith. There's no such thing as a faithless life. We're always trusting in something. And here, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, is a call from all of those thousand pulls in a thousand directions back to put our faith in God first and foremost and exclusively, the Lord alone. And that's challenging for us because we're talking about the God who speaks out of the midst of a fire and he reveals himself to us in his words and yet he remains transcendent. And, and yes, we understand Jesus, but still God can, can, can blow our minds and he feels beyond our control and that makes us unsettled as human beings who want to be in control of everything. We want to hold the knowledge of good and evil and we want to control our destiny and we want to set our path and we want to be our own gods and kings and here we have this God who's totally free and, and so we try to gather God up or contain him or whittle him down, or fit him into a box that we can set on a pulpit, or in our living rooms, or in our own hearts, that at least we can predict and manipulate even. We reduce God. But whenever we reduce God, we are in fact fashioning idols. And Calvin had this other quote, it's just staggering. He says, wherever men fashion God, they fasten him. Whenever we try to whittle him down or fit him into a box, we just fasten him right there. And all the freedom and power and goodness of his character is almost by our own doing insulated from our lives. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. It's a call for our divided hearts to return back to a place of oneness in direction and focus toward God. 
love the Lord your God. Next part of the command. And the question comes up, what does it mean to really love God? And certainly there is an element of this that is emotional, that is effective, talking about our affections and what we feel. But as you read through the rest of the book of Deuteronomy, it seems that the concept of loving God is constantly connected back to obeying his commands, hearing what he says, and doing it. Even Jesus picks up this theme, John chapter 14. He says, if you love me, you will do what I say. Or 1 John chapter 5, this is the love of God, that you obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. There's this incredible link. What does it mean to love God? It means actually doing what he says. Think, in my marriage with Amy, if I told her up and down all day, I love you so much, you're wonderful, baby. You're beautiful. I sing to her. Sometimes I actually do sing to her. I don't know if she loves it or not. I mean, I think deep down she really loves it, but like kind of at a surface level, it might be annoying. <laughs> but just imagine if on Monday, I tell Amy in the morning, oh, I love you so much. I'm so grateful to be married to you. You're wonderful in so many ways. And she says, oh, thank you. Can you just today like help and do the dishes? And I don't do the dishes. And it gets to Tuesday. Oh, baby, I love you. You're so wonderful, so beautiful. I'm so fortunate that, that you said yes to marry me. And I want to sing you this song, and you're great, and your eyes are amazing. She says, okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. But would you just, could you help with the dishes today? And I don't do the dishes. And then Wednesday, I get up in the morning. Oh, I love you so much. You're so wonderful. What is she going to think? Do I really love her? No. Why? Because I've not valued the words that have come from her heart. I'm not valued her by doing what she's asked. God here is talking the same way. You shall love the Lord your God, not just as an emotion, not just singing a song, not just saying nice words to God, but actually doing what he says with everything that you have, all your soul, all your might, all your heart. In the history of the Christian church, the early readers of this passage saw heart, soul, and might as different dimensions of the person, kind of your, your mental, heart, decision-making side, your soul, kind of feeling side, the, the spirit, these different aspects of entirely loving God. The Jewish community read this, and they saw it just a little bit different, that, that there's sort of these complementary ways that we love God, that our heart is our loyalty, that our soul is our life. That we love God even unto death. And that our might, our strength, is our substance, our possessions, what we own. However you understand or slice it, the point is clear. Love the Lord your God with everything you have. And then Moses says, remember this. Meditate on this. These words, the reminder to love God with everything you have, bind them to your doorposts, bind them to your forehead, keep them near your hands, teach them to your kids. When you walk, wherever you go, keep them close. What's he saying? He's saying these words should give shape and inform every aspect of our lives, touch every aspect of our lives, our homes, our work, the work of our hands, our traveling, our relationships, every single time and place touched by, above, below, before, behind, everything touched by this command to love God with everything that we have. And this is freedom. The God who sets us free calls us to love him alone. Because when we love the one who sets us free by his very nature, we find ourselves walking in the freedom that he gives. When we have divided hearts pulled in a thousand directions, you know what, we're not free we find ourselves in life-sucking connections. We find ourselves bound to this and this and this and this and this and that thing. God says, let's simplify it. Love me. Let the affection of your heart, the obedience of your life be drawn to me. And you know what you'll find? A life-giving connection. This is covenant. 
covenant with me and covenant with one another, the people of God. This is, this command, the Shema, hero Israel, this is the undivided God commanding us to live in undivided love that leads to undivided freedom. And this one God, we remember that all the evil, all the temptation, the sin of our heart, he gathered up all of that and dealt with it in one place, once and for all, in Jesus. So that the prayer of Jesus in John 17 might become reality. The grace that comes before obedience, the sacrifice, the crucifixion of Jesus, opening a way for the fulfillment of the great prayer of Jesus in John 17, that we might be one with God, just as Jesus is one with the Father. The great philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said, purity of heart is to will the one thing. Here is our challenge this week. Here's your challenge this week to carry and remember, maybe even write this one command in every aspect of your life. Tomorrow morning you get up, kids go to school. What does it look like to love God in that? You go to work, what does it look like to love God in that? You're talking to your wife, what does it look like to love God in that? You're talking to your husband, what does it look like to love God in that? Going to practice after school, what does it look like to love God in that? Go to your group, your, your missional community group, family on mission, what does it look like to love God in that? You're talking to your neighbor, you're ordering at Burger King, whatever it is, what does it look like to love God in that? Here, O oh grace, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, the Lord alone. Let us love him, the Lord our God, with all our heart, all our soul and all our might.